I'm Oscar Osbo, and today we're talking with Tim Echterhoff about his days in the radio business. Hey, Tim, how'd you get started? Well, I got started. Of course, I was into radio because I was on uh, campus call on KBZ in class break, a go-go on WTRU in high school. And I was just fascinated that these guys could make money playing records and having fun. I thought, what a way to make a living, you know? Uh, so that's how I got into it. I think originally I went to Fred Tascone and said, hey, I'd really like to work here when I graduate. He said, well, do you have a first class FCC license? I said, no, but I, I can get one. Well, that would give you an edge because we're directional half the time and we have to have a first class operator on duty. So I made arrangements to go to REI in Florida and get that license. But I thought before I leave, I'll just call the other stations. I'll call KBZ and say, hey, I might be back uh, later this summer with my first class license because they were directional. And I called MUS and MUS said, hey, do you have a third class license? I said, no, but I, I can get one of those tomorrow. Well, come on out and talk to us. So I went out to the radio station and uh, recorded a few commercials. And they said, OK, uh, you get your license, you got the job. So I skipped my high school graduation rehearsal, went to Detroit, got my license, trying to think what songs were on the radio. Uh, Percy Sledge and When a Man Loves a Woman and Sonny by Bobby Hebb and all this stuff. And I get back with my third class license and I'm on the air full time working six to midnight the night after I graduated. Wow. So that was my start. But really, uh, the story of MUS goes back to 1947. It was the second radio station on the air, MUS 1090. Second radio station, of course, KBZ had gone on 20 years prior to that. Uh, they were the established station, the one your parents listened to. And uh, WTRU had come on in 49. They were actually WKNK when they came on. So MUS had a studio orchestra and a studio on Peck Street, Kitty Corner from Marshfield. And then TV was on the horizon. You know, you can see what TV is going to take over. And the people that owned it, I'm not sure who owned it was, but uh, they... Uh, started panicking and they were losing advertisers and uh, I think that was a daytime AM went on from sunrise to sunset and they went bankrupt so Mike and Charlie Boonstra who owned Boonstra Brothers Coal Company in the Heights and some other investors came in and bought the radio station and they looked at it and said well <laughs> the overhead is way too high we can't afford a studio on Peck Street and a transmitting site on Giles Road. We'll just move the whole thing out to Giles Road and save money, you know? And it was moving along as the number three station, later on the number four station when KJR came on, it dropped to number four. And the programming was, when I got there, I mean, the only thing good on the radio station is they carried the Indy 500 every Memorial Day. And they had some Notre Dame football, I think, on Saturday afternoons. But mutual news. But, I mean, the programming was off the wall. I mean, it was not a format. It was whatever who was on the air and wanted to play. And you could go from, uh, oh, geez, Louis Luai by the Kingsman to Camelot. I mean, you, you had no idea what you're going to. And then from 3 to 4 in the afternoon, it was all polkas. And I'm just a new kid on the block. I said, well, why all polkas? Well, that's what everyone wants to hear when they get out of work. <laughs> I, said, I didn't get the memo on that, you know. But uh, so we had, you know, not very good ratings. And so I was doing nights. And one thing we would sign off at midnight, between 11.30 and midnight, that would be on the FM, uh, we'd play uh, the World Tonight. It was a program on mutual news. We'd tape it earlier and play the tape. And it was like a half hour rundown of the day's news and some features. Well, there was a story about country music and how country music is gaining popularity in America. And I recall, well, gee, you know, the Grand Ole Opry would come to uh, the touring groups would come to Muskegon and sell out the Walker Arena. You know, that might be something to think about. So I saved that tape and put it on Beverly Curtis's desk. She was the general manager and said, hey, this might be worth looking at. 
And she listened to the tape and talked to a few people. It turns out our station in Wisconsin, near Sheboygan, Wisconsin, was already doing country. And they were doing pretty well with it. And the decision was made that we're going to go country on August 10th of 1966. And I think at the time, John Graska was the program director. And that decision was made when he was on vacation. So it was like, huh? I mean, I can uh, agree with a Jimmy Dean song now and then. But I mean, you go country? What are you thinking? So anyway, he didn't stay around long. But uh, Jim Fleischer was there and John Seacar. Jim Cox was there when I got there. And me and, uh, you know, John you know, Seacard. And uh, it, was, it was a good group. And we went country, and it was not an immediate hit. But let me see this. In 1964, the rating company that did measure the audience in the market was called The Pulse, a company out of New York. And they would do uh, in-person interviews and diaries and compile the ratings. Well, the last one that had been taken before we went country was in 1964. In 1964, WTRU had a 56% share. AM 1600, you couldn't even get it at night in the whole county, but they were playing the Beatles. It was 1964. And KBZ was solid, they were like a 35 share. We had those two together, it doesn't leave much. WKJR, which had just come on, 1520, with religion, uh, they had more audience than MUS. In fact, the miscellaneous column had more audience than MUS. So we had nowhere to go but up. So we flipped the switch, the switch and went country. In country, uh, we didn't know much about country. We just kind of looked at Billboard magazine and played those songs and played some country oldies. And uh, But by 1968, things were starting to broaden out. You know, Bobby Goldsboro had Honey. Well, that was a number one pop hit, but it was a number one country hit. And we started to realize that if we played some of the pop stuff that we could get away with, along with the country, we could really build an audience. Well, they took another rating in 1968. We were two years into it. Well, we had good ratings in midday, especially with women, uh, 10 to 3. We still suffered, you know, in the wintertime. If you sign off at 5.15 at night, you're not going to have a lot of carryover audience. FM, I mean, FM, who knew what FM was? I mean, our call letters on the FM were WFFM, and we played these hour-long tapes of music primarily to feed into the Hasper E Save More Markets. So you'd be playing that, you'd fade down every 15 minutes, you'd have a song going on the AM, you'd fade down on the FM and read a Hasper commercial and then fade the music back up. And uh, I mean, there wasn't, every now and then somebody would actually sell an ad on the FM. <laughs> we thought, Boy, they're robbing these people, that isn't fair, you know, because who's listening, you know? But I think in 1970, we decided to start simulcasting the AM and the FM. And we'd have promotions and give away FM converters for your car radio. I think you'd plug in and you'd pick up the FM and it would pipe it through one of your AM channels. And we did a lot of that, plus some of the newer cars by 1970, 71, 72, were coming out with AM, FM radios. Well, that was, wow, that really was something. So by uh, 75, uh, we took a rating. I think you'll see that number one bank that's sitting over there on the table. It, it says uh, the Pulse Incorporated 1975. Well, we were number one. We were number one in Muskegon in 1975. Plus, Arbitron then started measuring ratings for the whole area, West Michigan. So they had the Grand Rapids TSA, the Grand Rapids ADI. Well, gee, we were starting to, you know, make some noise. Uh, in 1974, 75, we upped the power on the FM from three, about 3,000 watts to 31,000 watts. And we finally went stereo, one of the last stations in the world to go stereo. And we later moved up to 50,000 watts. In 1980, we moved the tower to Hilton Park Road off of M46, so we're halfway to Grand Rapids. Well, then we had one of the best signals in all of West Michigan, and we would conceivably, you know, constantly be number two, you know, behind Wood FM or number two behind KLQ. But I mean, we were like right up there with the big guys and really dominated, you know, Muskegon. Uh, we 
you know, because people that lived in Muskegon and worked in Grand, in Grand Rapids could go all the way there and back and not lose us. And uh, so it was a big, you know, benefit. We hired a Grand Rapids sales staff, and, uh, you know, Randy Crow joined us in 1980, and he brought on the Grand Rapids sales staff. And so our sales, I think the first year I was manager, I kept moving up, started out as a disc jockey doing nights and burning the trash when I got off the air, okay? And next thing you know, I'm the program director. So I'm telling all the other guys when to play what jingle and when to do this and when to do this. And then next thing you know, I'm uh, getting into sales. And pretty soon I'm station manager. And then after that, I'm general manager, chief engineer, still on the air. I was doing all the jobs, you know, but it was, it was fun. I mean, it was, it was fun. How much fun can you have, you know? And uh, then we started growing. We opened the Grand Rapids sales office after the uh, new signal went on. And, it, you know, it was just uh, an, amazing, an amazing ride. We had some audience numbers in Muskegon toward 50% of the audience in certain demos, like 35 to 54, uh, sometimes 25 to 54, 35 plus. And again, we were reaching out, playing a lot of pop crossover because there was no FM station in Muskegon that played adult contemporary. So we'd play a lot of Olivia Newton-John and Kenny Rogers and whatever we could get away with. Uh, Moonlight Feels Right by Starbuck. <laughs> it's got a kind of a country sound to it. And so we'd play a lot of this stuff. And so that people from WTRU with whom we were competing, you know, would say, oh yeah, I, yeah, I know these songs and you know, uh, so basically that was our competition and it took us a long time to really get ahead of them in billing because they were like the billing giant. They did most of the revenue up until, you know, around 1980. But from 1980 until uh, I left in uh, 94, it was, it was kind of a constant uh, climb to the top. The first year that I managed the station, and it's hard to believe in today's dollars, but uh, the billing, the total billing on the station was 156000 So for $156,000 a year, we paid all the people, had a few contests, paid the electric bill, whatever the taxes on Giles Road were, you know, and, and we were making money. And the next year, we billed 206. And it was constantly, like every year, we're going up 25%, 25%, 25%. And we'd constantly adjust the rates every year. So every year we got more audience, but every year we're charging a little bit more for it. But we could always advertise that we had the lowest cost per thousand. And last year I was there, we did 2.235 million in sales. And, uh, and I was spending, and you'll see, some of the exhibits, you know, the, the, the billboards and the TV ads and the buses, all the things we were doing, we were everywhere. There were times when I'd have 12, 15 billboards up in Muskegon County, but I'd have 20 or 30 up in Grand Rapids, all at the same time, you know, during the rating period. So I'd spend up to $400,000 a year on advertising and promotion but it all paid its dividends because we're in the ratings in Grand Rapids. We got all the money coming in. This is before email, before you could quickly get something from Muskegon or Grand Rapids to Muskegon or vice versa. So our Grand Rapids team would put a package on the Greyhound bus every afternoon. And I'd be at the bus station waiting for it to come. We'd have all the tapes of other commercials that we're going to plug in, the work orders, all the orders to write up and put in the system. And I would do that, sometimes be there till 7 o'clock at night, putting all of Amy's orders in the system, you know, so that they'd be on the air the next day, or write them on the log if we had to, you know. Uh, but uh, it, was, it was quite a ride. Can you tell us about the people you work with, Tim? <laughs> a lot of story. I mean, we had wonderful people. I mean, we had people on the air, and Jim Cox was with us a long time, did a great job. Mike Murphy, Dan Mason. You know, Dan Mason left us to go to Reno. He's still in Reno, but he is morning man and program director of KKOH, a 50,000-watt news talk station. But he did very well. John Allen, of course, we lost John Allen, but John uh, was a tremendous asset, you know, on the air. And you just think of all the people that were involved, Nick Scott, uh, Steve James. I did miss a few things in the original tape that you did at my house. And, you know, over 28 years, it's hard to remember all the people that came and went. 
But a few that I should mention that we didn't mention is one of Bob Moore. Uh, Bob and I broke into radio at about the same time, and he uh, actually filled in for me on the air when I was on active duty in the Army Reserve. And he mainly, though, was an engineer. He kept the station on the air and uh, fixed everything. Did the same thing for us at JML and in Duluth. So he was a, a veteran. We used to call him Super Tech. On the air, we uh, forgot to mention Tony Wright, who was a great guy. He was on in that same era as Steve James, mid-70s. Uh, D.C. Cavender was on the air with us. He was part of that Super Q group that came to work for us, John Allen and Dan Mason. Uh, Chris Roberts, another one. Uh, now, Chris was the one who converted MUS into pre-planned music. He did the music logs using a program called Selector, and without Chris, that wouldn't have happened. And Chris also did the Saturday Night Country Oldies show on MUS for a number of years, and he's still around. Uh, Linda Sims was on the air with us, and Linda married Dan Mason, and they're still together out in Reno, Nevada. Paul Erickson, one of the funniest people ever, uh, very creative. He was on the air for a time in the 70s, early 70s, maybe late 60s. And uh, Paul went on to a radio career all over the state, including WJR, WWJ. And he was really in the creative department. And he did the best commercials and is still very, very creative. Uh, Fran Silva. Uh, where would we be without Fran? Because Fran ran the office for 25 years. That means the traffic and the billing and the accounts receivable, accounts payable. Uh, he, she actually helped us make the transition to computerized locks. In fact, the program for those was developed by Harry Brown. Harry worked for this, as we talked about earlier, on the air. But then Harry went to Grand Valley, got his computer degree, wound up uh, running the computer science department at MCC in Muskegon. But while he worked for us, he saw all the labor going into making the daily program log. And said, there's got to be an easier way to do this. So he developed a software program. And, uh, and then it, we implemented it, ran them side by side, the manual and the computerized program for a time. And uh, it worked. We wound up actually taking that program, creating a company called Master Software Systems, uh, which Harry really you know, had developed. And we marketed that around the country and put it on a number of other radio stations. So it was like another source of revenue for us. Uh, so Fran did a great job making that work and uh, keeping us all in line. <laughs> and when Randy left, when Randy Crow left, uh, we had to hire another sales manager. Randy left for the opportunity to run WLCS as they were being launched as a classic rock station. And uh, he could look at me and say, hey, I'm not going to be general manager here for a while, so here's an opportunity. And I said, hey, grab it. What, what else What can go wrong? So he left to do that for a time, and I had to hire a new sales manager. So Dave Weehy from TV 13 had been calling on me and I was very familiar with him because he had been in radio at WCUZ Grand Rapids before he went to TV. And so I hired Dave to run the sales department. That would have been about 1987 or so, and he stayed until the until I left, and until a little bit after I left. And I think that he later ran KBZ in Muskegon. But uh, Dave is a great guy, and I tell you what, we were putting the numbers on the board. Uh, you know, whereas I was worried when Randy left because maybe we we're going to flatten out, but you know, we kept kept it going up. Uh, one other person uh, instrumental is Mark Stevens, who later left MUS to come to work where I am now at RCP. Uh, but Mark, uh, we hired from J.W. Messner in Grand Rapids, an ad agency, and he had done all the Chevy dealer group ads for this area, and he had a lot of experience. And really, he was not an air talent at MUS, but he was our creative services director. So he basically was the brains behind the commercials. Because we thought, well, we can be a little bit more than just a radio station. We can actually be a complete full service place for people to get their creative done and everything. And he was good at it. He passed away about five years ago, but uh, he was a great asset. And the last person that I should have included and probably put at the top of the list was Amy Grassman. She was Amy Schaff at the time, but Randy and I hired her uh, to run our sales in Grand Rapids after we put up the new tower. And Amy, you know, what a tremendous asset, a bill in, you know, four or five hundred thousand a year herself. 
and she put the uh, packages on the bus, and I'd pick them up at the bus station every night from Grand Rapids, and it was like, about a bunch of orders, you know, and uh, so Amy, uh, and we're still friends with Amy, I, I'm going to see her next month in Florida, but uh, she had a career after MUS, B93 and W Light in Grand Rapids, but uh, she was again part of the, su part of the uh, success story at MUS. Every other radio station had all these rules. The people on the air can only be on the air. The people that are in sales do sales. Never should the two cross. It was kind of like that in the newspaper business too. The editorial people could not sell newspaper ads and the people that sold newspaper ads couldn't write stories. Well, I thought to myself, hey, that's how I got into sales. You know, I'm making a hundred bucks a week and I want to raise, well, go sell some advertising. So I finally figured out, or I very quickly figured out that for every hundred dollar a week order you put on the books, that's 15 for you. Well, you put 10 of those on, that's 150 for you. You just doubled your pay, you know? And so I taught uh, Steve James and Nick Scott how to do that. And Steve James especially was very good. I mean, he was like the king of Apple Avenue. He had every client up and down Apple Avenue on the air. And Nick Scott knew a lot of people, and he was from the White Lake area, and he got those people on the air. And it also kept them in their on-air job because anybody that wanted to hire them, well, they are making too much money to go to a disc jockey job somewhere else, you know? In our contests, you know, we were part of our advertising and promotion budget was a lot of contests. And uh, we had cash call that went on for, geez, down near 20 years. We call people at random and ask them if they knew what was in the MUS cash call jackpot. And started out, you know, the started out at $10.90 and would go up. Well, then pretty soon we started out with $107 and went up from there. And uh, geez, when we were done, we always started at 107, but we'd up it by 20 bucks a time. And so next thing you know, you're getting like $1,400 in the MUS cash call jackpot. Well, that makes, you know, people tune in. We had a contest in uh, 1975. We were the host of the Coca-Cola Hot Air Balloon Fleet during the Seaway Festival. They had uh, the Coke, Mr. Pibb, and Sprite balloons down at the Lakey Foundry site, where Terrace Point is now. You know, that's where the balloons launched from. And we'd have mobile phones in the gondola of the balloons. We'd have a different jock in each balloon each night. Harry Brown. You know, Harry Brown was in there, and Harry Brown was another person that was just really instrumental in the success of MUS. He left and went to ABC in Chicago and came back. You know, and we had Dave Rogers, who we lost a few years ago. But uh, in any case, we had a contest. Uh, guess how many cans of Coke it would take to fill all three hot air balloons. And I used to have a... Uh, I think he was a physicist or something on my paper route. I knew he was a math guy, Dr. Tellis. I called him and I said, hey, here's the dimensions of these balloons. You give me a number. <laughs> How many cans, 12-ounce cans of Coke it's going to take to fill these balloons? So we had the numbers. So it's a high-low thing. You know, call in. Well, you're too high. You're too low. And, and the winner got a Plymouth Gold Duster from Friendly Motors. And uh, so I had the, I got a picture of me and the president of Coca-Cola, Dora Peterson, and uh, Joe Benton from uh, Friendly Motors, you know, as we present the winner with the uh, Plymouth Gold Duster. So that was another contest we did. We uh, had a check it out sweepstakes we did in the uh, late 80s. We mailed 160,000 pieces of mail and each uh, mailer had checks where people could fill in and then they'd mail them in. One of the winners could get their choice of any car that they wanted up to 20000 And it, that was a lot, a lot of money then. Now that's like a mediocre car, but I mean then that was a pretty nice deal. And actually the winner chose to get two cars, uh, two $10,000 cars. <laughs> Once we got the numbers, you know, the business really kind of came to us. Uh, it was, yeah, it was pretty amazing. Can you mention some people you admired in radio? I mean, Don Anderson, uh, when I was on Class Break a Go-Go, you know, in my early high school years, he was the coordinator of that. He was assistant PD at True. 
And he actually taught me how to do some production techniques in the production room. And, you know, and I always thought he had the best presentation on the air, great uh, production capability. Uh, Tom Shine worked there at the time, Skip Knight, you know, sailing along with the old skipper, night in the morning, you know. We lost him a few years ago. Lynn Gibson, not sure what happened to him, but, you know, you're... Uh, what was uh, Lynn Gibson on the midnight ride, you know, Hooter on the scooter with the midnight sound. <laughs> uh, but they had some great talent there. KVZ, you know, they were the very institutional station, but uh, Bill Stevens would be on the air in the morning. And he was kind of like Jim Cox. He's he just talking to you. He's just talking to you. And he'd tell some stories and express some opinions of his own. And it was good. They had good news people. Clark Manning did the news and a number of other people. Bill Hill was there. Uh, you know, again, they were a, a very good radio station. And by the time we, you know, got rolling, you know, it was really a three-station deal, True, MUS, and KBZ. And we all, it was enough for us all to make some money. And uh, Docket 8090 kind of opened the floodgates because now that allowed for all the new FMs to come on the air. You know, 104.5 came on, started out as beautiful music, did a good job, but uh, then they were bought by somebody who turned it into Top 40, Goodrich. And uh, they had a good talent lineup, though, too. They did a good job. And they have since moved to Grand Rapids. And it's ironic. Uh, we used to have to fight with clients in Grand Rapids and say, you're a Muskegon station, M-U-S, it spells Muskegon. I said, no, M-U-S, music starts with M-U-S. You know, we're the music station. And uh, turns out, now iHeart, we sold the radio stations uh, for about five and a half million dollars to uh, Connoisseur Communications. They sold it to Cumulus. Then Cumulus did a, a swap with Clear Channel, which is now iHeart. So Clear Channel acquired MUS. Well, they also by then owned Wood AM, Wood FM, B93, uh, The Brew, uh, ESPN, ESPN 961. All those are under the iHeart umbrella. Plus they acquired you know, SNX and uh, MRR and MUS. And, uh, and the old MUS AM, which is now WKBZ 1090. And uh, they decided a couple of years ago, because there's a generation of people growing up now who don't know what AM radio is. If it's not on FM, they don't know how to find it. Well, a lot of news talk stations around the country, even WBBM in Chicago uh, and TMJ in Milwaukee and uh, SYR in Syracuse, they've all gotten companion FM. So they simulcast their AM and their FM and expand their signal. Well, Wood Radio at 1300 had a beautiful tower set up south of Grand Rapids with 20,000 watts. They went from 5,000 to 20,000, except it's kind of directional and it didn't cover the lakeshore. So Holland had a hard time getting it. So they decided to take the MUS country format from 106.9, move it over to 107.9, which had been Magic 108, and uh, they simulcast Wood AM and MUS FM became Wood FM at 106.9. And they went from stereo to mono because there's no stereo news, you know. It actually increased the signal. And now they're number two in Grand Rapids, and B93 is just ahead of them. Uh, but, uh, yeah, they, they're a good company. They know what they're doing. You know, I think Cumulus knows what they're doing. There's so many stations. That's the problem. I mean, you look at Muskegon, and you've got a pie. And you've got uh, MUS and MRR, both at 50,000 watts. Uh, you've got KBZ AM, uh, which, you know, doesn't add it to a lot of ratings. Uh, because more people probably who want to hear news talk are going to listen to Wood FM because uh, they've got a lot of local elements, you know. Uh, but you've got uh, LCS, uh, you've got LAW. Uh, I mean, you go down the list, you, you've got 12 radio stations basically trying to serve Muskegon. And there's not any more budget out there 
probably than there was in 1995 uh, because, again, you've got all the uh, network bias, the consolidation of businesses. Uh, you, know, you didn't have Home Depot and Lowe's and a lot of the little local hardware stores have gone away. And uh, the car dealers are mainly owned by groups. You know, you got one company that might own, you know, five or six dealerships or more, you know, and uh, so it, it and it's just a different world out there, you know. Randy and I both came from the retail side of selling advertising, and we had a lot of relationships that went way back. I mean, I started calling on Boyd Earls uh, at, uh, geez, at, it was Hunt Sales and Service in Montague back then. But he was a sales manager who had just come in from Lansing. This is 1977. I wound up buying his Cordoba demonstrator, you know. <laughs> I had three Cordobas, in fact, with Corinthian leather, you know. But uh, we go way back, and he's in the process of retiring now. You'll see now on the TV ads that uh, uh, it says Lakeshore Chrysler, not Boyd Earl's Lakeshore Chrysler. But, uh, I mean, you figure that's, that's 40, 50 years. Yeah, I mean, that's a long time, you know, uh, to deal with one client. And the day that I signed on with RCP, uh, I signed up two clients that I still have today, we still have, we still have Lakeshore Chrysler, and we have Don Ripma Chevrolet Oldsmobile, was, was Chevrolet Oldsmobile, now it's Chevrolet Buick GMC, but those are two clients, and uh, geez, uh, Hall Sports Center and uh, Langlois, a lot of these clients that I worked with, you know, through the years, and uh, Muskegon Break did a lot of work for them, and it was just kind of a natural, you know, transition. And Randy, you know, is still working with uh, a lot of these same, uh, the same folks, you know, the uh, the Bettons who now have all the preferred dealerships, and uh, and the other Bettons, Betton Baker, <laughs> uh, who has, I don't know, 18 dealerships. Tim, can you tell us a little bit about your relationship with Randy Crow? You know, I, I hired Randy when he was 18 years old. He walked in my door one afternoon and said, hey, I, I heard you have a sales opening. Well, there was another individual who I had hired from True who was going to start that day. And she called me and said, I'm not coming. You're not coming. I've got your cards printed. I got your calculator. I got you're ready to roll. Nope. True is going to give me a guarantee. And I said, the only guarantee in sales is that if you sell something, you get paid. If you don't sell something, you don't get paid. And that's it. There is no guarantee. And she said, well, I'm staying here and sorry for the inconvenience. So <laughs> a few hours later, Randy walks in the door and said, hey, I'm Randy Crow. And you might have heard me. I do weekends on True as Randy Collins. I said, really? Well, I heard you have a sales opening. How do you know that? Well, I ran into somebody else in Grand Haven who knew that this person had bailed out on you, and uh, it was Lucy Nally. And Lucy told Randy, you should go talk to Tim. So uh, he came and talked to me, and I said, well, have you ever sold radio time? And he said, no, but I went through the sales training program at Zales Jewelers. I said, well, what have I got to lose? So here's a rate card and a package of information on the station, coverage, map, and all this stuff. Hit the road, and I'll have your cards printed tomorrow. So he took off and comes back the next day for like three or four orders right out of the chute, you know. I think, wow, these are people we haven't had on the, on the air before. That was 1980. So, uh, and it went on from there. I mean, he just started bringing in business. In fact, Steve James was our sales manager. I think we had Jim Kukuru in the sales department and Steve James and Howard Seacard was still around at that point. He was about to retire. And Randy comes in and he's shaking things up, you know. And uh, Steve James comes to me and says, you know, this kid, he's better at this than I am. He says, I ought to just be a salesman. He should be sales manager. So that was the next step. Randy became sales manager. And then uh, we became certified radio marketing consultants. That was something the Radio Advertising Bureau was promoting. So we all went to this training program on how to best serve the customer. So we all could put CRMC behind our name, you know, like we're a doctor or something. You know? <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, we were a, a good team. We had our fingers in some other radio stations because we bought in 1977 JML in Petoskey, 10,000 watt AM, 100,000 watt FM on top of Boyne Highlands. 
And uh, that was that was probably the most exciting ride. I mean, MUS was a great long-term story, but there were a lot of radio stations in northern Michigan, Traverse City, Gaylord, Sheboygan. But every station sounded the same. They had their morning show with a lot of news and talk and features and then some conservative talk show in the mid-morning and Lost Dogs in the afternoon and classical music at night. Who knows what, you know? And uh, I went up and heard that station. And I came back and I worked for Bunker Rogoski. He was president of the company at the time. He was a returning, an attorney in town. And he had been working in a, with the Boonster Brothers in that group since the beginning, you know. And I said, Bunker, we got to go up and look at the station because uh, it's for sale. We went to uh, have lunch with one of the uh, employees and they said, yeah, the station's going to be sold in a few weeks. I said, why? Well, John Harrington, who was a former Chicago broadcaster, had put that thing on the air also had Harrington Marina on Walloon Lake and some other investments and had everything well planned except he didn't plan to die. And he passed away. So the family had to get rid of something and rather than getting rid of the marina, they decided to get rid of the radio station. So I had driven to uh, Sault Ste. Marie and it came in there. And I'm driving all around, it's coming in everywhere. Traverse City, going out of Traverse City, it's still coming in. So I said, wow, the only other top 40 station up there at the time was WVOY 1270 in uh, Charlevoix. And they were doing a wonderful job, but not much of a signal. So we looked at their numbers and Bunker met with their people. And they had a date when they were going to open the sealed bids. And we were the top bidder. And I think we billed, uh, bid 640 for it. And they were so far behind, they didn't even know what they were billing. We were estimating they would bill in 76, 320, but it turns out they billed over 400. So we really bought it on sale. And uh, we closed on the 1st of February of 77, changed the format on Valentine's Day. And we went from what they were, the same as all the other stations up there, to uh, kind of a top 40 format. We had the MUS format, jingles, contests, uh, the same on-air approach, top of the hour IDs, you know, it's it's one o'clock at Northern Michigan's music station and the jingle would play, you know. Uh, it, it sounded the same as MUS except the music was different. We were top 40, so instead of playing uh, Merle Haggard, we'd play Marvin Gaye, but a lot of the stuff in the middle, you know, Crystal Gale and Kenny Rogers and Olivia would be the same. And it was pretty slick sound. And people started, we thought, you know, we're going to lose business on this deal because all these long-time advertisers are going to be shaking in the boots because we're changing everything. Well, it turns out whoever sat closest to the phone made the most money because the phones ran out there. We want to buy ads on your station. We want to buy ads on your station. So we, uh, and we moved the news. I mean, every station in northern Michigan had their network news at the top of the hour. So that's when ABC had four networks. They had ABC Information, ABC Contemporary, ABC Entertainment, and ABC FM. And we chose the Entertainment Network because it actually fed at the bottom of the hours. And we would tape delay it, play it at 55. So by the time it was over, we'd be back into music before when everybody else has got talk, when everybody else has got news, and we'd be playing music. So uh, that worked out great, and a lot of things. We, before we had ratings in northern Michigan, we got a call from the phone company. They had AT&T up there. They say, every time you guys say call in to win something, it could be a box of donuts, it takes down the AT&T long-distance network for northern, northern Michigan. And I say, gee, really? I mean, can you, can you just write me a letter saying about how many people that affects or how many people must be calling? You tell me we had ratings, we use that, and, uh, and then we had ratings. Uh, I think in 1978 we had Arbitron do a report, average co average quarter hour and cum estimates, a book, and there were. I don't know, 35 stations that showed up in the uh, rating report. We had more audience on JML, AM, and FM than all the other 35 stations combined. And, and we were giving away, well, we gave away a Plymouth Horizon in 1978. And you know, we had cash call like we had at MUS. Uh, we had good air staff there. 
and some of the uh, MUS people eventually, you know, migrated there, and uh, yeah, you know, that was a good story. And you know, again, uh, Doc at eighty ninety opened up all these other frequencies. Well, pretty soon, you know, there were almost as many uh, radio stations in northern Michigan as there were uh, trees. <laughs> <laughs> we got to the point where this was not as much fun anymore. There was a, a point, and it was probably, you know, three, four years, when JML, in a town of 6,000 people, was billing more than MUS, including our Grand Rapids income and everything. That was pretty amazing, you know. Uh, but then uh, the people that owned VOY, Tim Moore came back to town, put on 100,000 FM, 106 KHQ, and, uh, oh, they had a top 40 station, The Peak and Gaylord, and Sheboygan went classic rock. And, you know, it got all these other stations, you know, slicing up our pie. And then we decided that we would go light rock because, uh, you know, if you're going to divide up, we'd rather have the money end of it than the teenagers. So uh, we let KHQ do their top 40 thing. We went light rock. And that worked, uh, you know, very well. Uh, and then at, at a certain point in time, you know, all our investors were uh, getting old, and a lot of them, you know, wanted to, weren't that interested in the radio business anymore, and we weren't owned by a big company, but the rules were changing, you know, where one company could own, used to be you could only own seven AMs and seven FMs in the whole country. Well, then it opened the floodgates, you know, where you can have, like, iHeart's got, you know, seven FMs in Grand Rapids, <laughs> you know? So, I mean, it's a, it's a whole different deal. So, uh, we started, uh, we sold, uh, our station in Duluth, Minnesota, we had a 100,000 watt classic rock station, KQDS, that went on 40 years ago, 1980, we went on with that. Actually, it's another, another radio station that was country originally that we bought out of bankruptcy in 1969 and then put an FM on and then went to 100,000 watts. And by the time we did all that, it was 1980 and that's when we put the uh, classic rock on and uh, that did it's number one station right now. It's a number one station in Duluth Superior. And uh, we probably got out of there too early, but again, uh, just time to start cashing in. So we sold MUS, we sold WPLY in Wisconsin, sold JML, and then uh, I was working in the ad business by then. You know? <laughs> in many of the other interviews, the one name that comes up at MUS is Maddie Davis. Is that something that you started or? No, Maddie was on the air when I got there. Uh, in 66, and she was uh, on the air when I, when I left uh, for that long run. Uh, she, uh, the Heavenly Echoes, Maddie Davis and the Heavenly Echoes, they'd come in on Saturday morning, or Sunday morning, rather, and their show was at 8.15, because that's when we signed on in the wintertime. And I remember one time I overslept, and still living at home with my parents, and she calls, and hey, where's Tim? Oh, Tim's still in bed. <laughs> so I get in my, my Ford convertible, go flying out to the radio station, and I get there, and they are all standing outside in the snow, you know, and ah, guess what? I forgot my keys. So <laughs> I break the window to the control room and climb in and turn the uh, transmitters on. But the transmitter, you can't just turn them on. you got to let them warm up a little bit first. So uh, I got in trouble for that. I mean, I had some early, you know, learning experiences, but uh, yeah, Maddie Davis uh, goes, you know, way back. They had another uh, quartet, the United Juniors, who would be on following her. And we actually did some brokerage of time uh, on the AM side on Sunday mornings. We had the Lee Sane Soul Train. <laughs> <laughs> with, uh, you know, all these guys. And it was fun. I mean, you know, I'd engineer that, and, uh, you know, we'd, we'd record it earlier and then play that, and uh, that, was, that was fun. A lot of good stories there. Uh, Tim, whose idea was it to move from Giles Road? Well, it was probably time. I mean, frankly, I think we made more money on Giles Road. I'm sure we did because we didn't have any overhead. But uh, we had a lot of money that we had accumulated, and... Our accounting people said, if you don't spend this on something, you're going to get taxed for having it, or you'll have to distribute it to the stockholders, and they'll get taxed on it. Maybe they don't want to be taxed on it right now. So uh, we looked around, and that was a good location, because we're thinking we're doing this business in Grand Rapids. And at that, that time, the Holiday Inn across the street was still doing very well, and, you know, there was, uh, it looked like a good place 
to go. And we had an architect to figure out how to reconfigure the building, and uh, we spent quite a bit of money uh, on that. But then we moved in with all new equipment, uh, and it was, you know, the Taj Mahal <laughs> of, of Muskegon Radio. It was, you know, and that was just one radio station. It was just us in that building. Later it was, you know, MUS and MRR and, you know, whatever else. But uh, I think Magic 1600, you know, for a time before they went off the air, uh, were all operating out of that building. And again, you know, automation and all this has changed our business so much uh, because we always had live people 24 seven and they darn well better be answering the music line. And if you call the music line, it better be answered 24 seven. And we had the same format 24 seven. We never paused to have an hour long show of public affairs or any of that stuff. We instead had action line, which was like a, a one minute capsule of somebody calling in about something and then us getting a response from somebody. So we'd edit it, you know, uh, MUS action line, taking action for you, you know, and, but we'd just plug it in like a commercial. But we met our uh, public affairs obligation in that way without ever having to say, hey, we're turning everything off for two hours and we'll be back with real music program. We always had the same thing. And we, you know, Randy uh, was really good at, on the sales side of selling overnight spots. I mean, we'd sell at a rate, this is the 24 hour rate, and here's the 6A to 7P rate. You're actually getting a better deal. And, you know, people are up, you know, some people get up early, go to work in Grand Rapids, and they're up at four in the morning, they're hearing those ads. It might only cost a dollar, but you know, you're on the radio. And uh, so our station sounded about the same at three in the morning as they did at three in the afternoon. We had Tradio on the radio, uh, that was a call-in thing at 10, 20, 12, 20, and 2, 20. And later, when the FCC mandated for a time that you could not simulcast 100% uh, your AM and FM, we built another studio on Giles and had somebody else from 10 to 3, Dave Rogers would be on the AM, and whoever else, Harry Brown or somebody would be on the, on the FM. But we didn't put Tradio on the FM. Tradio then went just to the, to the AM. And, and then, you know, everything runs its course. I mean, then the internet comes along and you know, Craigslist and all this stuff. But uh, that was, again, that was something that drew people to the radio station. And why did you choose Mike Majeski as your engineer for your state-of-the-art studio? Well, we knew Mike, and uh, I think he was pretty well, uh, had established himself as the best in town. And uh, I mean, he's now chief engineer at all the town square stations in Grand Rapids. So he's got to be a busy guy. But uh, and he, you know, wanted to do it right. You know, not have wires running everywhere. And you know, he wanted to have the engineering side of it uh, be as good as it could be. Can you tell us some of your favorite female DJs that you've run across? Well, we had Sherry Wilson, who we lost, you know, a few years ago. Uh, we had Diane Shepard, who was on the air for a time with Jim Cox in the morning, and now she's married to Nick Scott, and they both live in Petoskey. She runs Petoskey Tourism, and uh, Nick uh, is in the computer IT business. And he still does, he's still doing uh, preferred TV ads. I hear him, you know, they saw one this morning. And that's Nick's voice, but he does that from, from home in Petoskey. And, uh, my voice is still on Lakeshore, Chrysler, Jeep, Dodge, Ram. And uh, so we all, and Randy, of course, it's Rocktober at <laughs> Pet and Baker Chevrolet, where Michigan shops. So, you know, yeah, we, we, I guess that's, we all have that ego thing, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's fun. Oh, Pam, you know, Pam had the best voice. And she was actually on WQ uh, as they, just before they were sold to uh, Goodrich and became SNX. And I always liked her voice, talked to her a few times, and I think she went to uh, KLQ. She was at KLQ for a while. And then I hired her, and she did mornings. It was Mark and Pam in the morning, and a lot of commercials. And, uh, and then she left for a time, and Peg Daniels plugged into that spot. And then, you know, Chris Roberts and Peg Daniels both went to South Bend. But then they both came back. You know, I had more people that would leave and come back. You know, you let them go or they go. I mean, uh, Dan Mason and John Allen, uh, one Saturday afternoon, came to me and said, hey, 
uh, we're going to leave. This is our two weeks notice. We're going to the new radio station that's going on the air in Hart. I said, really? Yeah, it's going to be Album Rock X105, WCXT. I said, really? And that's back when I was talking to high school groups or the business college or whatever. They bring me in and just talk about radio like I'm doing now. And uh, they said, well, what do you think of that new station in Hart? And I said, well, they got really good people. The audio sounds great. I mean, it's, it's a good sounding radio station. You know, I just don't know how effectively they can sell it. But, uh, you know, they're off to a good start. Well, it took about a year and a half, and both Dan and John are, are back with me again, you know, because things didn't all work out the way they had hoped. But that's radio. I mean, that happens a lot. You know, you look at all the format changes over the years. The more things change, the more they stay the same. It shows the radio dial in Muskegon. And all the format changes, that this station used to be this, and then it was this, and then it was this. And we were always the same. You know, MVS is still country, still right there. And, uh, and that, obviously, that helps. Longevity helps. I'd get up at 3.30 in the morning, you know, do the morning show, go to the post office at 9 o'clock, get the mail, open the mail, pass out the bills and the checks and everything, hit the road, sell advertising all day, come back at 4.30, write up my orders, do production, and go home. Then I, the phone rings. Hey, we had a cash call winner. You want to come in and do the promo? So I go back to the radio station and do the cash call promo so it could run on the air in the morning. You know, the people know the reason the jackpot's lower is we had a winner yesterday, you know. So I probably spent too many hours working. And I come in, I mean, if it was Saturday morning, I'd still go to work at 6 and see what's going on and uh, do this and do that. And uh, yeah, that was one nice thing. You know, when I made the transition to uh, RCP, that guess what? It's five days a week. I mean, what can happen? It's only advertising. It can't hurt you. So, I mean, if you're out of there Friday afternoon, you don't think about it till the next week. Everything is in order. Nothing really can happen, you know. Can you tell us a little bit about Frank Poling? I took uh, speech and radio from Frank Poling, and he had been a broadcaster, I think, in Battle Creek, and... Uh, I think according to Steve James, he had 20 of his students at Muskegon High over the years that wound up going into radio. And I would have probably been, you know, number 15 or 16, I'm not sure. But Harry Brown, you know, would be an alumni of that as well. And uh, he, well, again, what high school has a studio? I mean, we actually had a studio with a control board and turntables and tape machines. and you could sit up there and do the uh, student announcements for the whole high school. Well, we're at a high school back in the 60s, 62 to 66, two and a half thousand students. So that's a pretty big audience. That was bigger average quarter hour than some of the Muskegon radio stations had. And you're just saying, you know, the ski club's gonna meet in room 402 at four o'clock this afternoon and, you know, whatever the announcements were every morning. but. Uh, having, and Steve James did the same thing, I'm sure Harry Brown did. Uh, that's what an experience that is. It kind of teaches you, you got to be in a certain place at a certain time, and you know, you got to uh, deliver, And but it was great, because I mean, then everybody knew who I was. I was always, uh, I was uh, Tim Ace in high school. You know, Tim Ace dealing the hits from the top of the deck, you know, and all that. Uh, and I went to MUS, and everybody had a nickname. It was Shotgun Wyatt, and Half Shot Fleischer, and Smiley Jim Cox. And I was Ace Actorhoff, but never really used it much on the air. And, you know, I figured, well, I had always been Tim Actorhoff, you know, and uh, I didn't realize, I think if I were to do it again, I'd be uh, Tim Allen or something like that. Uh, it's easier to remember and to spell and all that. But, you know, my dad, uh, had a funeral home and at the time an ambulance service that was, you know, picking up a thousand people a year. And so a lot of people, the actor Hoff name was pretty familiar in Muskegon. And that's how I started. That's how I, how I stayed. But I sure did give a lot of other people names. I mean, you know, uh, Steve James, uh, his real name, I don't even have to say it here, but uh, he was going to use his real name. No, no, that's kind of complicated. Let's, here's a jingle package from our station in Duluth, singing a bunch of names of former jocks, you know, pick a name. 
and he picked Steve James. He could have been Scott Carpenter or Tony Bennett or all the like, different names, but uh, he became Steve James. And uh, Dan Mason had come from Super Q in Whitehall, and uh, he was Daniel Boone. And I said, ah, that sounds like you're trying to attract teenagers or something. Uh, yeah, I'm thinking about Mason Rook beer. So you can be Dan Mason. How does that sound? Okay, I'll be Dan Mason. And Pam Roberts, you know, her name started with a Z, as you know. And uh, I'll give you a radio name here. You can be Pam Roberts, okay? And <laughs> uh, did a lot of that, you know? Mark. Yeah, Mark Dixon. Uh, his last name, real name, starts with a D. But I said, well, that's kind of hard to remember. But I'm thinking country music. you got the Mason Dixon line. You could be Mark Dixon. And... Uh, so, yeah, I did a lot of that over the years. I mean, Harry Brown is Harry Brown. He never changed, but it's a good name. You know, it's a good name. Someday when I grow up, I'll hopefully have a voice like Harry Brown. <laughs> it would be nice. But I think I've told most of my stories. You know, you know we were in the swamp, you know, MUS on Giles Road. We were in the swamp. And you know how there's cables that run out to the tower, and they have to come into the building and sometimes there's a little gap there, you know, and the relay, relay racks in the hall had all the meters and the audio processing and so on, but there's little cracks here and there, and, and these animals can get in the building. So one day, uh, uh, people are all excited, and there's a rabbit running down the hall getting chased by a weasel, and they make a left turn and go in the general manager's office at the other end of the building. And Beverly Curtis was the general manager, and she's screaming. She's up on her desk. And Jim Fleischer comes to the rescue. They have a, a cigarette lighter on a, a wooden pole, almost like a baseball bat, but it's sitting on the coffee table, a cigarette lighter on top, grabs that thing and kills the weasel. But by then, the weasel had already killed the rabbit. And they had light-colored carpeting, <laughs> There's blood and guts all over the place. I don't think it was ever the same. You know, but that was just another dig in the swamp. <laughs> MUS was really good at was getting out there. You know, there were times when we'd have 15 billboards up in Muskegon and 25 up in Grand Rapids, and you couldn't go anywhere without seeing an MUS billboard in uh, the TV spots. 107 MUS, West Michigan's continuous country. Start your day with Murphy in the Morning. 107 MUS, 10 in a row, hour after hour. Country for West Michigan, 107 MUS. Move up to 107 MUS. All those elements, uh, it's funny that we would do sticky notes, you know, post it notes with our logo and all this stuff. And I'd have the stations, the big stations like Wood, they'd have a national sales manager. And the national sales manager would go to Chicago and Detroit and call in all these big media buyers. Well, we didn't have any money. We didn't want to have a national sales manager. It was just me. And I'd put together packages and mail them to all these people. But they'd have MUS sticky notes and, you know, stuff to put under night lights, all those things. You send somebody a night light, that's going to wind up in an outlet somewhere, maybe in their bathroom. But, I mean, I'm just saying MUS will be top of the mind, you know, and uh, we did a lot of that. And these guys from Grand Rapids say, oh, geez, you must be in Chicago all the time calling on these guys. And I said, no, never been there. <laughs> I know how to call them. <laughs> I remember, you know, we used, we'd sponsor everything we could. For a while, we would sponsor the top of the hour ID. And Bill Vanderplow from Smitty's Beverage Company uh, thought it would be fun because we always say, boom, it's 8 o'clock at the music station, you know, and play the jingle. And 
he wanted to say, it's Miller time. And we would have 24 hours a day. We'd have, you know, uh, whatever their slogan was, it's Miller time, Miller Brewery Company, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Boom, it's, time, it's 10 o'clock at the music station. You know, He called me one day at 6 in the morning. He said, you know, I don't think 6 in the morning is Miller time. <laughs> Let's just cut that back to the afternoon and the evening. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, radio was good to me, and radio, country radio, uh, I don't know if you saw this thing on PBS, the uh, recent documentary uh, on country music, but uh, being part of that was really something, you know, because in 66, it was Eddie Arnold and Loretta Lynn and, you know, and it kind of progressed, you know, through the years, through all these different stages. But I always joke with people and say, you know, country music, that's what paid for the condo in Florida. Because <laughs> <You know? laughs> it was good to me. We were in the right time at the right place. And we stuck with it.